Good morning. Thanks for the invite. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the problems about diagnosis of surgical site infection that Julie Bruce has already referred to. And then I'm going to talk to you about the instance of surgical site infection in vascular surgery. Um, and then look at the evidence supporting the choice of dressing changes to reduce surgical site infection rate in vascular surgery. But first, I would just like to use a couple of case studies to highlight why surgical site infection in vascular surgery is so important and so, much, so different to other forms of surgery. The case on the right is a lady who had a carotid endarterectomy, which is an operation to clear the, the artery out in the neck to try and prevent strokes. This unfortunate lady got a, a surgical site infection which went all the way down to the artery. And if you look ca carefully at the bottom of that picture, there's, a, there's a, a white patch on the artery. And it's a prosthetic material. And if that prosthetic material gets infected, it has to come out. This lady went back to theatre, had that prosthetic material replaced with vein, but unfortunately suffered a stroke and died. The second picture is the leg of a 54-year-old man who had a femorodistal bypass, a, a bypass from the femoral artery to one of the distal arteries in the leg to try and save his leg. He had critical ischemia. We'd normally use vein, but this chap didn't have any vein, and we had to use a plastic artery. This surgical site got infected. The infection went all the way down to the graft. As I've said, because it's prosthetic, you can't get rid of the infection without taking the prosthetic material out. We had to take the prosthetic material out. This chap ended up losing his leg. So surgical site infection rate, if surgical site infection in vascular surgery is a specific problem with significant consequences for patients. A little bit about the epidemiology of surgical site infection. Um, it's, it's the third most common healthcare uh, associated infection in the UK only secondary to chest infections and UTIs. It's the most common reason for patients being readmitted to hospital. And if you get a surgical site infection rate, you're more likely to die. It's also associated with high levels of pain, um, more quality of life impairment, longer hospital stays, higher numbers of return to theatre, and as we've heard this morning, a huge, huge cost to the NHS. And as we've also heard this morning, reduction in surgical site infection is therefore a major priority, not only for the NHS, but for clinicians, practitioners, and probably most importantly for patients. The CDC define a surgical site infection as a proliferation of pathogenic microorganisms, and that can either be a superficial or a, or a, or a deep infection um, within 30 days of an operation or up to one year if you put an implant in. But this doesn't really help us because surgical site infection um, is a clinical diagnosis. It's diagnosed uh, according to local symptoms and signs and systemic symptoms and signs, including erythema, swelling, pain, uh, pus and wound separation and if, if that infection goes systemically you get the systemic signs of pyrexia, tachycardia, confusion, hypotension. The asepsis score uses these symptoms and signs uh, to not only diagnose but also to grade uh, the severity of, of the surgical site infection. Um, it, was, it was developed you know, a, a long time ago now in 1986 and the problem with the asepsis score, it requires people to look at the wound to, to score the wound. And more recently, uh, Rhiannon Macefield in the Bristol group with Jane Blaisby um, has developed a patient-reported asepsis score, which patients themselves can, can complete um, and makes diagnosing and grading surgical site infections uh, a lot more straightforward. So we've got a way to diagnose and grade surgical site infection. So what's the, what do we think the instance of surgical site infection rate is in vascular surgery? Well, vascular surgery is, is clean surgery, and so therefore we would expect the rate of infection to be less than 5%. And if we look at registries, uh, Public Health England would, would seem to support that. 
uh, in their report in 2014, they, they found that surgical site infection rate in over 7,000 vascular surgical procedures was only 2.4%, and slightly higher in amputations, but still less than 5%. A slightly more detailed registry in the states, a quality improvement program a year later, suggested the surgical site infection rate in vascular surgery was actually a lot higher than that. Uh, it was approaching 10%, and suggested reasons why Public Health England study only identified 2.4%, because actually 75% um, uh, of surgical site infections were actually diagnosed after the patient was discharged. Um, which wasn't captured in the Public Health England study. The American study also identified that surgical site infection rate is probably highest in, in patients who are undergoing lower limb vascular surgery, so either bypasses or amputations. And particularly, they identified specific risk factors, um, which included critical limb ischemia and long operative times, which these complex femdistals often are, and um, patients who are having groin anastomoses. So the registry would suggest that uh, surgical site infection rate in vascular surgery is, is probably about 10%. However, if, if, if you then you go on to look at randomized controlled trials, which actually look at surgical site infection rate as an outcome measure, um, the rates are probably much higher. You know, they're all, they are of the order of 20 to 30 percent. And why are they so high? Well, we, we're all aware of the risk factors, the patient and procedure risk factors for surgical site infection. Many of these patients who are undergoing lower limb bypasses um, and amputations are, are elderly, they're often diabetic, they're often smokers, they've got chronic kidney disease. What can we do to prevent surgical site infection? Well, you can analyse what we can do into preoperative phase, interoperative phase, and postoperative phase, and all these deserve attention. But what we're here to discuss today is is wound dressings. So wound dressings have been identified as an area where we can uh, attack to reduce our surgical site infection rate. Needless to say, it's been looked at. The Cochrane Group. Uh, published a systematic review in 2016. Uh, primary author was Joe Dumville, and they did a, an in-depth analysis. They looked at 20 randomized controlled trials uh, involving you know, 3,500 patients, um, and they identified um, 18, 18 different studies, um, two which compared, uh, sorry, 20 randomized controlled trials, two which compared dressings versus no dressings, and 18 which compared two different types of dressings. And in summary, they found there's insufficient evidence uh, covering surgical wounds with dressing reduces the risk of surgical site infection, or so uh, no dressing may be as, as good as uh, a dressing, um, and there's no evidence to support one particular dressing over another. But these, these studies, these randomized controlled trials, we're generally looking at uh, dressings such as silver, hydrocolloid, uh, thin film dressings. There was no trials of negative pressure wound therapy or advanced dressings such as, such as DAC dressings. So that, that, that Cochrane review was published in 2016, um, and th since that time, uh, these active dressings have been brought into practice. Negative pressure... So the mechanisms by which these active dressings may reduce surgical site infection rate, negative pressure wound therapy potentially removes excess fluid from around the wound, reduces uh, my pathogenic micro microorganisms in, in the vicinity of the wound, and there is some evidence that it actually might stimulate wound healing. Um, DAC is a hydrophobic fatty acid derivative which irreversibly binds microorganisms and therefore reduces pathogenic organisms in the vicinity of the wound. So what evidence is this to support uh, these, adv these active dressings in the prevention of surgical site infection in vascular surgery? Sparse, sparse is the answer, but promising is the answer. There's been three randomized controlled trials uh, 
the first by Engelhart in the International Journal, Wound Journal in 2018, looked at high-risk patients, patients who were having uh, lower limb surgery and had a groin incision. You know, the, as, as you've looked, seen from the incidents, these are the patients with a 30% risk of surgical site in infection. Um, and they looked, compared usual foam dressings with negative pressure wound therapy, and they found a, a significant uh, absolute risk reduction of 14%. A similar study a year earlier by Lee um, looked at similar patients and again compared a standard dressing with negative pressure wound therapy and found a non-significant reduction in, uh, in surgical site infection rate, probably because it was underpowered. Um, and Demusio uh, presented at the Society of Vascular Surgery last year, not, it's not, impressed, not published yet, but again look at, looked at groin wounds, comparing standard dressings with negative pressure and found a 13% reduction um, in surgical site infection rates uh, associated with negative pressure wound therapy. Um, so promise, negative pressure wound therapy, promising but equivocal uh, evidence. Hot off the press, some work that we've done, um, a feasibility study, Josh Totty, one of my research fellows, looked at DAC dressings um, in patients under low, undergoing lower limb, amputation, uh, lower limb amputations or bypasses, and we compared DAC dressing um, with occlusive dressings, um, and we found a 9% absolute risk reduction in surgical site infection rate. That didn't reach statistical significance because it's underpowered, and we're going to need a, a, a study of about seven, 800 patients uh, to ensure it's uh, of sufficient power, uh, sample size. So, in summary, surgical site infection in vascular surgery is associated with significant consequences. Um, limb loss, loss of life is a realistic uh, problem associated with this. It's almost universally underreported, and in certain vascular procedures, lower limb bypass procedures, amputations, especially those involving a groin incision, it's a major, major problem. It affects one in three patients. These new active dressings, negative pressure wound therapy, DAC dressings, uh, represent a promise, promising weapon in our armamentarium against surgical site infection, um, but more, more evidence is required. We're currently putting together um, application for HTA, multi-center randomized control trial. If you're interested in being involved, please contact me. Thank you. And thank you to Ian. Is there, are there any questions for Ian at all? Hi, thank you very much. Very interesting. Have you looked at the issue of um, when you're harvesting veins and the lower leg, the role of compression um, early on rather than, you know, from the community's perspective, we'll see the wound uh, from the surgical site, uh, dehiss, and actually our next step is to put them into compression. And I just wondered about um, the role of that earlier intervention not necessarily high compression, light compression may be a role there, um, you know, because you've inadvertently produced uh, some uh, functional venous disease uh, through that change. Just wondered what your comments were on that. Um, I'm not aware of any study that's, that's, that, that's looked at that. Um, I would be a little concerned that vascular surgeons would be worried about compressing a vein bypass that they've just put in. Um, you know, they'd be concerned about patency rates, whether that had resulted in an in increased uh, occlusion rate of the bypass that they've just put in. Um, but as I say, um, I'm not aware of any, any studies that have specific, specifically looked at that. Okay, any other questions for Ian? 